Okay. So good evening. On behalf of the Union League Club of Chicago Library Committee, Literary Subcommittee and Archive Subcommittee, welcome to the first of our three-part series of virtual programs on Black entrepreneurship in Chicago, past, present, and future. The ULCC has been a part of Chicago history since its charter in 1879, and we are pleased to honor Chicago's rich history with programs such as these and through our upcoming ULCC prize for an outstanding book on the history of Chicago to be awarded in March of 2021. Tonight's program focuses on the story of Anthony Overton, known as the Merchant Prince of Black Chicago, as told by Dr. Robert Weems Jr. We will open up the conversation to questions from our audience during the last 15 minutes or so of the program. So please put your questions in the, into the Q&A and we will try to address as many of them as possible. It's now my very great privilege to introduce our speakers for the evening. Dr. Robert E. Weems Jr. has been the Willard W. Garvey Distinguished Professor of Business History at Wichita State University since fall 2011. Before coming to WSU, he taught at the University of Missouri Columbia and the University of Iowa. A native of Chicago, he received his PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. During his career, Professor Weems has published and spoken widely in the areas of African-American business and economic history. Besides the book he will be discussing this evening, Dr. Weems has produced four other books in the realm of African-American business history, Black Business in the Black Metropolis, the Chicago Metropolitan Assurance Company, 1925 to 1985, Desegregating the Dollar, African-American Consumerism in the 20th Century, Business in Black and White, American Presidents and Black Entrepreneurs in the 20th Century, and Building the Black Metropolis, African-American Entrepreneurship in Chicago. In addition, Professor Weems served as a historical advisor and appeared in the documentary, Boss, The Black Experience in Business, which premiered on PBS in April 2019 and was shown here at the club last week. Dr. Weems' community-based activities include serving on the board of directors of the Heartland Wichita Black Chamber of Commerce. In this capacity, he has established and coordinates the organization's Wichita Black Business Hall of Fame initiative. I am also so very honored to welcome Christopher Robert Reed, who is Emeritus Professor of History, Roosevelt University. He is a native Chicagoan who has deeply felt connection to the heart and soul of Chicago, its people and their history. Professor Reed is the author of six books on organizational life in Black Chicago, including The Rise of Chicago's Black Metropolis, 1920 to 1929, and Black Chicago's First Century, 1833 to 1900. So I thank you so much to both of you for being here. Um, I'm sure there's a great deal to talk about. So I'm going to stop and uh, turn the program over to you too. Uh, it's a great honor for me to interview the author and especially at the Union League Club of Chicago. Uh, we share many things in common. That is the love of Chicago history. Of course, you've mentioned we're both Chicago natives. And it seems auspicious that the Union League Club has invited uh, Professor Weems to speak, recognizing his scholarly work and the subject of his work, because it was just 100 years ago at the Union League Club of Chicago recognized the business acumen and activities and accomplishments of African Americans in the city on, the, on Chicago's South Side. Professor Weems, excuse me, Professor Weems has written an exemplary book on a titan in Black Chicago history and a man who was recognized citywide for his accomplishments. 
he took on a Herculean task and he combined biography, one of the most difficult aspects of historical writing, with the history of black business on the South Side, something that really was never written about until Professor Wayne undertook this task. I want to go directly to uh, a question, but I must mention that I had my appetite read for Black Chicago history about 60 years ago when my late oldest sister casually mentioned that there had been a colored bank on the south side of Chicago, either at 31st Street or 35th. Well, it turns out she was probably talking about the Overton Bank, better known as the Douglas National Bank, or the Binger State Bank. Both banks were uh, within a two block radius of each other. In any event, this got me started. And I am really excited to hear Professor Weems talk about the real story of black banking via the life and accomplishments of Anthony Overton. Uh, Professor Weems, can we get started by you perhaps combining the experiential and intellectual roots that led you to write this major study? Yeah, thank you for, uh, for that question, Professor Reed. Yeah, this book pretty much is part of my sort of long, you know, ongoing evolution as a scholar that has an interest in Black Chicago history and specifically the history of Black business in Chicago. I, I can literally remember when I was, and you can remember this too, Professor Reed, when you know you pass your comprehensive exams and you have to find a dissertation topic to write on. And I knew that I wanted to do something on the history of Black Chicagoans, but I was kind of torn as to whether or not I wanted to do something related to the political development of Black Chicago or the business or economic development of Black Chicago. And literally, in, in one of the best decisions I've made in, in my life, I decided to go uh, the business route. Uh, as was stated in the introduction, my, my first book on Chicago Metropolitan Insurance Company was my revised dissertation. And over the years, uh, I've built upon that, that interest in Black Chicago history that literally stem when I was a teenager, you know, growing up in the city in the 1960s, living on the south side of Chicago and having a, a, a basic awareness of what institutions like, you know, Seaway Bank meant and Seaway was on 87th Street and also Highland Bank on, on 79th and Ashland. And when I, came to discover that these were, were African-American owned banks. You know, that, that gave me a, you know, a, a sense of pride even before I had you know, even thinking about being a historian or doing business history it was just something about the presence of substantial African-American businesses on the South side that was you know, a literal source of pride. And later in my professional career, through my research, I've sought to illuminate that history. And, and part of that illumination is the recent book on Anthony Overton. Were you inspired uh, by uh, any scholar in particular to uh, undertake this uh, project? Yeah, another great question. I re literally remember when I was a beginning assistant professor. And I went to a, a lecture by, by the eminent historian, John Hope Franklin. And in this presentation, uh, Professor Franklin outlined what he considered to be a complete research and publications career for a historian. You know, he said that, you know, we need to produce at least one monograph. And a monograph is essentially a single subject book on a particular topic. Also, he said, a historian needs to produce an edited book. And I have, in fact, in my career done two of those, the most recent one being Building the Black Metropolis, looking at 
African American entrepreneurship in the Windy City. And, and one of the contributors was yourself because you literally are the preeminent expert of Black Chicago history, uh, you know, especially before uh, the 20th century. And when, uh, again, I, 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 going back to this, this lecture that, that Professor Franklin gave years ago, based upon his stature as a historian and someone that I admired because literally uh, John Ho Franklin was one of the eminent historians of the 20th century, black or white. And he was a real inspiration, I know, to a lot of, of us African-American historians. And when he made the point about writing a biography, that was something that literally stuck in my head over the years. And, and, and I knew at some point in time that I had to do a biography. And ultimately, uh, based upon you know, my exposure to Black Chicago business history, uh, the name Anthony Overton kept coming up and coming up. And I decided, well, you know, Anthony Overton was in fact going to be the subject of this biography. But as I came to find out, uh, this project turned out to be a, a lot more challenging than, than I initially anticipated. But again, seeing that project in the rearview mirror, I'm just so glad that I was able to complete that project and, and really feel a big gap in terms of uh, local African-American history. I think in the past you referred to Overton as uh, being much more than a single issue or single element uh, businessman. Of course, he founded the Douglas National Bank, a chartered bank, uh, I think only the second in America uh, that an African-American headed. But he did other things. Could you uh, tell the audience about the uh, the uh, extent of what you have described in the past, both in writing and speaking, as a business empire? Yeah, well, literally uh, to this day, you know, Harvard University Business School has this database of of American business leaders, and Anthony Overton is listed as the first African American to build a major business conglomerate. Mm -hmm. uh, his cornerstone enterprise was the Overton Hygienic Manufacturing Company, which focused on you know, African-American personal care products. Uh, as you mentioned, he later expanded into banking when he assumed the presidency of the Douglas National Bank. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years later in, in 19, cause he became president of Douglas National Bank in 1922, in 1924, uh, he started the Victory Life Insurance Company in, in, in a one room office in the Overton Hygienic Building. And literally within three years, uh, Victory Life had the distinction of not only being the first African American insurance company that was granted the right to do business in the state of New York, which had very strict requirements to do business, but it was literally the first Illinois insurance company, black or white, that was granted permission to do business in the state of New York. And part of the glue that helped to tie together uh, Anthony Overton's uh, initial uh, business empire was his publication, The Half Century Magazine, which was a magazine that was primarily aimed at uh, African-American female consumers but it featured a, a literal plethora of advertisements for Overton hygienic products. And also it discussed other Overton uh, initiatives. And, and literally in, in my thinking about Overton, you know, the Half Century Magazine and later the Chicago Bee, you know, the newspaper that he owned, he, and he later built a separate building down the street from his Overton Hygienic Manufacturing Company home office for the Chicago Bee, having these media outlets really gave him a competitive edge over you know, some of his competitors because again, he had this access to, to media and a very interesting uh, true business maneuver, if you will, in terms of Anthony Overton and the Half Century Magazine 
in order to deflect you know, charges of shameless self-promotion, Anthony Overton literally put forward a female associate as the editor and owner of the Half Century magazine. And, and again, he was able to you know, deflect that, oh yeah, he just started this to promote his stuff. Uh, that's, he, he did do that, but again, he was shrewd enough again to use a, a female associate to be the public face of that uh, periodical. That's quite a business record he established by the 1920s. You mentioned, uh, of course, insurance, banking, publishing, and uh, cosmetic manufacturing. Uh, but you also mentioned how he built the Overton building from the ground up. And that building, of course, is still standing at 36th place and state. And I was informed yesterday that it's being fully used. Uh, and that's amazing. This 100 year structure is still providing space via services to the Chicago community. Uh, I also wanted to ask your uh, opinion on him as a real estate speculator, since in fact, the Overton building and as you mentioned, the Chicago B building represents his diving into real estate. Could you comment just very briefly on his interest in doing that? Yeah, Anthony Overton, uh, similar to his one of his competitors, Jesse Benga, was definitely you know involved and very interested in in the real estate business. Uh, for instance. Uh, the Douglas National Bank was an institution that helped to, you know, finance real estate uh, purchases throughout uh, the old Bronzeville community. Uh, in fact, Anthony Overton had a subsidiary uh, enterprise called the Great Northern Realty Company. So Anthony Overton, you know, he had his fingers <laughs> in, in everything. literally everything that was going on uh, in Black Chicago. Uh, in the early 20th century. And that informs the audience that uh, here was a man that the, the Union League Club might want to visit when they made this tour of the South Side 100 years ago. They didn't come to the South Side to see slums or dispossessed people. They came to see what one group of Chicagoans was doing to contribute to the success of Chicago's economic growth and development. Now, as he uh, pursued his various interests, he developed competitors. You already mentioned Jesse Binger, the city's first banker who had opened the Binger Bank in 1908. Uh, might you uh, make a comment about how he got along with Overton and, and another competitor when he, when Overton started the um, uh, Chicago B newspaper, which had come out of the half century magazine. He became a competitor, Robert Abbott, the owner of the Chicago Defender. How did these men uh, uh, link up? How did they react to each other? How were they as competitors? And I'm hopefully you'll share something about how they were as business collaborators helping the um, South Side develop. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Professor Reed. When we look at people like Anthony Overton, people like Jesse Benga, people like Robert Abbott, while they were self-interested businessmen that were concerned about growing their own businesses, the evidence seems clear that they were first and foremost race men. You know, as you know from your own research, you know, race, you know, being a race man or a race woman was the highest compliment that one could get in early 20th century Black America. And when we look at, at the associated business clubs, to me, that's a real extraordinary example of business cooperation mm -hmm. among competitors, because literally the Benga State Bank was a direct competitor to you know, Overton's Douglas National Bank. As you alluded to earlier, the Half Century Magazine and later the Chicago Bee was a competitor of Robert Abbott's Chicago Defender. 
but these individuals were able to literally transcend their own, you know, sort of selfish business interests to try to establish a what became a literal de facto black chamber of commerce through the associated business clubs, which really stressed business cooperation. And to all of these men's distinct credit, you know, they not just talk the talk about the race needs to cooperate in terms of business enterprise. Through the associated business clubs, we literally see these individuals, you know, walking the walk in that regard. That was very impressive. I um, uh, remember doing research and seeing that the Associated Business Club acted as a host for Booker T. Washington National Negro Business League, I think around 1923 or 1924. Of course, Chicagoans being Chicagoans, whether they're white, black, or whatever, consider Chicago as the center of the universe. When the business uh, association at Booker T. Washington had started, came to town, uh, they couldn't dominate black business activities. They couldn't be so influential as to be the leader of anything. What they did is they had to, quote unquote, bow down to the influence of the Associated Business Club headed by Abbott, Binger, and of course, Overton. But I was really struck by the cooperation that the ABC gave to the National Negro Business League when it met in Chicago in that year. In addition to- uh, I just want to piggyback off, off that point, Professor Reed, that and especially for, for the audience, when we talk about Anthony Overton, uh, Jesse Benga, and Robert Abbott, we're literally talking about the top three black business people in Chicago during the 1920s. And for them to come together, you know, stressing cooperation for business advancement, you know, that was that was huge. And as you say, very, very impressive. Uh, a um, would-be historian has written in the last 10 years that the space that these gentlemen operated in was not in fact real, that there was no black metropolis, that the black belt was just a space occupied by thousands of people of African descent who had no plan for their future and were making, uh, very, uh, making a very small contribution to the development of Chicago. Uh, on the other hand, um, um, we do see, as you said, something that was worthy of giving uh, the title civic pride to these activities. But there's something in addition to the business activities I wanted to go back to. And you had mentioned women. And I wanted to ask about the role of women in Overton's business operations. Of course, we know with this hygienic firm with beauty products and, and other things, uh, Black women were afforded the opportunity to work outside the home and outside of someone else's kitchen. It wasn't necessary to be a laundress or a helper somewhere else. You could go out and sell Overton products and act as a uh, person who was self-employed. This was a major step upward and it ties into what Madam C.J. Walker and Annie Malone were doing to help women elevate their economic status. Can you comment on that? Yeah, when we look at Anthony Overton, and this is one of the points that I, I stress in the book, just like all of us, you know, Anthony Overton's personality had some complexity to it. Mm -hmm. And on one level, Anthony Overton was an extremely conservative, you know, follower of Booker T. Washington. But at the same time, for the times, he had a fairly progressive attitude about, you know, the quote unquote proper role of women. And I think that started with the relationship with his wife, uh, Clara, mm -hmm. who herself was the daughter of an entrepreneur. And literally when the Overton Hygienic Manufacturing Company was started and got off the ground, uh, Clara in fact supervised the production 
of company products because Anthony Overton spent most of his time out on the road selling products. Mm -hmm. uh, later, uh, when uh, his daughters came of age, his daughters were actively brought into helping to market company products. In fact, uh, Anthony Overton, one of his innovations was that he established a office on, on South State Street where his daughters and other attractive young workers from Overton Hygienic worked as product demonstrators. Because at this moment in time, uh, African-American firms could not go to a, you know, a downtown department store to you know, demonstrate their products. And Overton, in fact, circumvented that part of, of racism by establishing his own product demonstration center that featured his daughters and, and, and other women. And, and this was, I think, being the pragmatic business person that Anthony Overton was and, and sort of comparing him to his primary competitors of uh, Madam C.J. Walker and Annie Malone, part of, you know, especially Madam C.J. Walker's marketing agenda was a proverbial before and after picture where you saw a picture of her before she used products and a picture of her afterwards. Now being a man, Anthony Overton didn't use these products so he couldn't use, you know, a personal testimonial you know, before and after photo montage. But what, again, what he shrewdly did was to utilize his daughters and other uh, young African-American females to, again, serve that purpose for his company as product demonstrators. As time went along, when we move forward in time, we see Overton Hygienic, you know, many of the supervisory uh, folk in, in, in the factory were women. Uh, later, the Chicago Bee, from, for about the last 10 years of its existence, had an all-female staff, including the editor. So again, you know, this is part of the interesting complexity of Anthony Overton that, again, this very conservative man had a, a, a real progressive attitude about the role of women during this period. But I think it was based upon you know, pragmatism. Because I, in fact, when I talk about Overton in the book and, and talk about Overton in, in other venues, he was literally a man in a woman's world in the context of personal care products. And he had to find ways to, to use women's surrogates to uh, better market his products. Uh, this is a positive for Overton. And it's not a quirk, it's being fair towards women. Uh, some might say it's a quirk because the 1920s was a period when male, white and black, especially white, uh, promoted uh, the cult of masculinity. Uh, if being fair towards women was a quirk, he probably had other quirks, quote unquote. And I wonder if you talk about him in regard to your establishing his origins and the story of his life. Was it filled with other quirks, ebbs and eddies that didn't flow straight? How obscure did he make his path, giving you real problems? Well, um, as, as you know, Professor Reed, you know, when you're working on a book, mm -hmm. you know, one of the first things you do is a review of the existing literature. And with Anthony Overton, you know, you have a variety of works out here that, you know, situated him, you know, being a, you know, a municipal judge in Topeka, Kansas in the 1880s, you know, being a politician in Oklahoma Territory in, in the 1890s and, and all types of, of, of stuff. And part of my literature review was consulting two books that literally shook me up in terms of, you know, progressing with this project. Uh, the first of these books was a book by uh, Thomas Cox, which is, a, you know, a social history of African Americans in Topeka, Kansas from 1865 to 1915. And in looking 
at, at, at Cox's book. And again, I had, I had seen all these other things about Overton, you know, being a business prodigy as a teenager and, and being a municipal judge. I was struck by the fact of looking at the index that Anthony Overton was not mentioned. <laughs> Similarly, when I looked at Jimmy Franklin's book on the history of blacks in Oklahoma, I did not see Anthony Overton's name in, in, in the index. So I'm like, huh, what, what's going on here? So literally that among other things helped me to really zero in on my subsequent research trips where I went to such places as Monroe, Louisiana, where he was born, uh, Topeka, Kansas. Uh, I went to Kingfisher County, Oklahoma to really separate, you know, fact from fiction in terms of his life. But to get to his motive, quite frankly, Professor Reed, you know, your work on Black Chicago in the early 20th century really gave me some insights in terms of as to why Overton might have felt a need to fabricate some of his past. And specifically, you, you talk about people such as uh, Ferdinand Barnett, the lawyer and other of black elites that, you know, really had a, you know, the aristocratic viewpoint in terms of who should and who shouldn't be considered as leaders. In fact, part of this aristocratic uh, mindset was that they looked down on Booker T. Washington right. because they believed that he didn't have the requisite, you know, academic background to call himself a leader. So I think as when Overton arrived in Chicago and found himself in this setting and, and, and with these individuals, to me, and this is just informed speculation, that I think that might have prompted him to you know, develop some of these myths about his past. And on a more tragic note, one of the things that helped Overton to sort of pull this off was that, you know, the other person in the world who knew otherwise, his wife, Clara, you know, pretty much died a year after, because they, they moved to Chicago in 1911, Clara died in 1912. So literally the person that, that knew otherwise was no longer on the scene. And that I think, you know, predisposed Overton to, if you will make up some tall tales about his pre-Chicago days, but to be clear, while there's some ambiguity about Anthony Overton's pre-Chicago days, once he arrived on the scene in Chicago from 1911 onward, you know, his accomplishments are, are very well documented. I'm talking about his accomplishments, uh, you had mentioned that he had taken the idea of selling uh, insurance in New York to a level where in fact the New York State uh, Insurance Commission said, yes, you can sell in New York. Uh, what were some of his other accomplishments? Uh, what recognition did he receive from the American business community? Well, we'll, we'll start with, you know, a major um, recognition he received from the African-American community directly related to his moving into a victory life movement into New York was that in 1927, uh, Anthony Overton was in fact the first businessman to win the NAACP's prestigious uh, Spingarn Medal. Uh, the following year, he won an important award from the uh, church organization that sponsored the Harmon Awards in business. Uh, another fascinating thing about Anthony Overton, and this was part of the challenge in, in, in working on this project. And this was one of the sort of stunning uh, revelations I got it in. And, and for the sake of full disclosure to the audience, uh, I was a fellow in uh, an organization called the Black Metropolis Research Consort Consortium in 1910. And Professor Reed was the advisor for this organization. And, and that summer in 2010, I really got a lot of research done uh, in Chicago on Anthony Overton. And one of the things that I discovered definitively when I was in Chicago in 1910 was that Anthony Overton's business records 
had been destroyed by his grandson, Anthony Overton III, when Overton Hygienic closed its doors in, in, in 1983. And when I definitively, you know, found out that these business records were destroyed, it took me a few days. That, that, that sort of hit me in the gut because as a historian, as you well know, Professor Reed, yeah. when you have important documents like that that are literally tossed in the garbage can and, and lost forever, you know, that, that's a real blow. I, I came to find out, uh, you may remember our, our colleague Tamar, who was yeah. the archivist. Right. You know, he, he shared with me that it's common for businesses when they, you know, close their doors to, you know, just discard their business records because, you know, that's sort of closing one chapter and maybe starting another chapter somewhere soon. But all this is to, to lead into the fact that without access to Overton's business records, I had to go an alternative route. And I had to consult the files of, of Dun and Bradstreet. A Dun and Bad Bradstreet, in fact, is a preeminent business credit, uh, credit re reporting bureau. And I was literally able to find Overton Hygienic uh, records literally from the 19 teens up to the 1980s, which literally helped me to fill in some of the gaps in terms of you know, Overton Hygienic's profitability, which I would not have been able to find because the business records had been destroyed. And as when I got into this project, I, dis I discovered why nobody had actually tackled this biography because literally a core set of primary documents had unfortunately been destroyed. Hmm, quite interesting. Um, I know we've uh, almost reached the 40 minute mark. I have to ask, uh, what was the uh, influence of the great events of this period on Overton's business activities, in particular, the great migration 1915 through 1918 at Boyd? 50,000 migrants to Chicago, hardworking migrants who were going to earn money that they were willing to invest. And then what about the Great Depression of the 1930s, which uh, did just the opposite, sucked the life, the money, uh, blood out of the Black community, the influence of great events on uh, business activity? Yeah, well, Anthony Overton, like other uh, pre-existing Chicago businesses were able to benefit significantly from the Great Migration. When you had, you know, this significant influx of African American migrants in the city, you had people like Anthony Overton, people like Jesse Benga, people like Robert Abbott, who were able to to benefit from this phenomenon, and that literally carried over into the 1920s, where in Black Chicago, like in other areas of the country, it was a literal boom period mm -hmm. for African-American enterprise. However, when we get to the 1930s, uh, Anthony Overton, in fact, became a, a, a major casualty of uh, the Great Depression. Among other things, we talked about real estate earlier. Uh, the Douglas National Bank and, and Victory Life had invested a lot of money in Black Chicago real estate during the 20s. However, when real estate uh, values fell in the early depression, we saw a, a lot of these properties literally become white elephants. Because in fact, Overton Hygienic building itself became a proverbial white, white elephant in that regard. And literally during the 1930s, we saw you know, the Douglas National Bank close we saw Anthony Overton being forced out as president of Victory Life. And, and during that decade, we saw Overton Hygienic lose about 90% of its, uh, of its wealth. But in the end, you know, Anthony Overton, uh, you know, the, the 30s were very tough for him. But in the early 1940s, you know, he was able to regain his reputation and literally when he died in 1946, you know, he was regarded as one of the more respected members of the Black uh, Chicago community. If I might add, um, 
I wanted to mention in regard to finding data from which you could tell the story you did. I was helped, and I was saying you were too, by the annual reports in the Tribune of neighborhood banks. And of course, in the uh, reports, you see that the, the Douglas National Bank stood up quite well in comparison to other groups and their neighborhood banks. Of course, you don't compare the Douglas National to the First National Bank of Chicago. You look at community and neighborhood operations. It looked quite well there. And, and this gave me great satisfaction. And uh, I have to ask you this, uh, to what extent did you uh, feel the same type of satisfaction when you found that you could go to Dun and Bradstreet and see, hey, here is the heart of my project. Well, it gave me satisfaction and, and I had the biggest sigh of relief in the world because literally yeah. I saw, well, yeah, this would actually enable me to do this project and, and have enough data that could, you know, when, when colleagues look at, at the book and say, well, okay, where's the data, you know, and, and I can explain, you know, what happened with the data, but here is a, a good substitute and, and people that have looked at the manuscript, including yourself, have, have seemed to conclude that I was able to uh, succeed in that regard. But, but, but yeah, that was really one of the more challenging parts of the project. But again, in, in life, we know that the things that challenge you the most, if you're able to overcome them, they give you the, the greatest satisfaction. That's true. I might ask our uh, hostess at the Union League Club, how are we doing for time? I think we're doing really well. Um, I do have a couple of questions from, from our participants. Um, you want me to go ahead and launch into those or did you want to do a wrap up? Uh, maybe we should wrap up and I'd like to just give a one minute wrap up before Professor Weems does. And that has to do with, he made reference to uh, Overton perhaps feeling somewhat uh, put off by the quality of the leadership in Black Chicago during this period. I just wanted to say that Chicago as a magnet attracted a great many talented Black men and women from the East Coast and from the South. And many would come to Chicago to attend the University of Chicago or the Art Institute or the Armor Institute or Northwestern. So you did have building up a cadre of very talented people who filtered in and became part of the leadership clusters in Black Chicago. Let me throw in Harvard also. I found three Harvard men here early in the century. Uh, Professor Weems? Yeah, and, and, and looking at Anthony Overton, uh, one of the more fascinating things about this individual was that clearly you know, he was a, a business titan. But at the same time, he was a very humble, if not non-assuming individual. Uh, I literally took the title of my book, The Merchant Prince of Black Chicago, from the broader title that Anthony Overton assumed in the late 1920s after he won the Spingarn Medal, where he was literally called the merchant prince of his race. Mm. And one of the fascinating things about Overton was that literally at the height of his career, he lived a very, very simple life. Overton, in fact, never owned an automobile for his personal use. Uh, he walked to work the vast majority of the time. If the weather was bad, he rode in his son's car to work. Also, like a lot of you know, successful businessmen who and business women who you know buy big homes and, and are really into the, the perks of business success. Uh, you know, Anthony Overton really didn't care about the perks. And, and one classic example of this was during the 1920s, as a widower, he literally, you know, rotated between living with one you know, in one child's home in their spare bedroom and another child's home in their spare bedroom. He was not materialistic 
at all. But again, he, you know, what really turned him on was, if you will, the art of the deal and just, you know, the, the mechanics of being a business person. That's what really turned him on. I guess we can move on then to a uh, question. Okay. Um, I have two questions from um, Bob Joint. His first question is, of all of Anthony Overton's various business interests, are there any remaining traces existing today? I'm actually surprised that his cosmetics business lasted until the 1980s. Well, one of the, the fascinating things about Anthony Overton, and, and in fact, I conclude the book in, in, in making this point, is that literally none of his uh, enterprises are extant, but just the, the presence that he had is, is still, you know, is still an inspiration to many. You know, the fact that, you know, the Overton Hygienic Building was refurbished, the Chicago B Building is refurbished. That in and of itself, I think, is just a testimony, you know, to the legacy of Anthony Overton. And, and, and that's really unique and I think really special because a lot of times, you know, out of sight, out of mind. But I think with Anthony Overton, we see somebody that clearly his name still resonates in, in, in many circles. Bob also wanted to know, um, do you recall the name of the founder of the Washington National Insurance Company? Uh, I, uh, no, I don't. You know that, Christopher? About that. Not off the top of my head. No. Uh, let me just say that there were many insurance companies during this period. In addition to Victory Life, there was the Supreme Life Insurance Company, which had been the first legal reserve north of the Mason Dixon line. There was the um, you wrote, Bob, about Metropolitan Assurance, which was, you know, which was insurance, assurance company. And there was a, a fourth one. What was it? Victory, Metropolitan, Supreme Life. And yeah, there were several mammoth. Mammoth, yeah. There, there, yeah more than a half a dozen active. This, this uh, Black Chicago was a, an active uh, uh, economic base during the 1920s. Very active. Um, Neil McCrillis had a question of, uh, well, I, I've really enjoyed hearing about Dr. Weems' work and a historian's journey toward this project, as well as the wonderful questions and contextualization of Dr. Reed. Can I ask what was Dr. Weems' favorite subject as a child, or maybe what was, did he, or maybe what did he like to read as a child? Um, I like to read everything. I had no, um, favorite, right? I, I'm thinking, uh, I, I've been thinking back uh, over this, at what point did I uh, develop such a history, uh, interest in history, that in college I decided I would major in history. I, I'm still working on that, but I had a <laughs> curiosity about everything. Coming from the South Side, like uh, Professor Weems did, we were exposed to a lot, we were exposed to the world. Just, for example, hearing about heroes, although I had never heard about Overton by name, but being exposed to heroes uh, in Chicago and being exposed to events like the Bud Billiken Parade, which recently had a million people come out and see every celebrity in the world, black world come out, inspired me. I was around, for example, uh, people who were professionals in just about every endeavor. Uh, when I was sick, I was thinking back to the 1940s, Dr. John Lewis, a black man came to our home and this father had been a doctor. They came from Iowa. My uh, niece's pediatrician was an African-American. The lawyers who I admired, and so many in Chicago were African-American. So although there weren't bankers when I was young and not a whole cadre of bankers again until the 1960s with independence, as you mentioned, Weems and Seaway and Highland and others, um, plenty of positive examples in Chicago. And I remember, and I'm gonna stop, uh, meeting Earl B. Dickerson, the first black graduate of the University of Chicago's law school, I think 1923. I remember met, meeting him at the Supreme Life Insurance Company where he had a uh, executive suite. And I thanked him for his company's 
lending money to my family so that we can move from the South Side after World War II over to the East Garfield Park area. But I got a chance to develop a, a, a friendship of sort with Mr. Dickerson, who was one of the outstanding uh, lawyers in Chicago. People still cite some of his cases. Dr. Weems, did you want to address that question as well? Yeah, I guess early on, uh, and, and a lot of this I have to pay homage to my parents, you know, because they literally made a point of having, you know, books and encyclopedias ar ar around the house. And, and, and one of the books that was present in the house was Carter G. Woodson's, you know, The Negro in Our History. And that was literally my first exposure, you know, to uh, African American history. And yeah, it, it was, you know, history has always been something that, that I've liked. And it's kind of a little funny story. Uh, I used to literally read, you know, history textbooks for enjoyment, because I remember, I, I guess it was like sixth grade. And uh, our teacher was was mad at the class for something. So she gave some quiz out of the history book that she thought nobody was going to pass. And, and I passed and she looked at me like, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I've always, I've always enjoyed history. And, and again, when I came of age as, as a teenager in the, in the late 1960s and was exposed to, you know, the civil rights and black power movement, you know, that really sort of re-energized, you know, my interest. In, 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 in history and, and even thinking about maybe at some point I could make a living based upon my, my interest in history. May, may I just uh, add, uh, Weems and others who are watching, you know me, you know I always bring out family, those in the family that inspired me. Uh, this is a photo from 1918 in Chicago and uh, here, where my finger is pointing, is my uh, great grandfather who came up to Chicago to be with his children before he passed on. He had been a veteran of the uh, Civil War. And uh, after my great grandmother died, he was left alone in Kentucky and he came up here where he had uh, at least six children living. And this photograph was taken in 1918. And uh, I've always had an interest in family history, was always inspired by the fact that I, I had to do something worthwhile with my life. And I hope when I'm gone, someone will look at this recording and say, he at least attempted. <laughs> we have another question from Will Barnes. Um, was S.B. Fuller influenced by Overton and did they have any type of business relationships? I really did not detect that, but this is not to say that Overton may not have had an, an, an inspirational effect on, on S.B. Fuller as, as, as well as others, because literally uh, Overton, and again, I don't think we can overstate just how prominent uh, Anthony Overton was at his peak at, at, as an entrepreneur, because literally, you know, besides being, you know, head of a, of a thriving personal care products company, uh, a thriving bank, a thriving insurance company, at one point in time, he was a guest columnist for the Pittsburgh Courier, where he shared with audiences across the country his ideas about business and and the like. So I, I, I could, you know, imagine that that Fuller would have been inspired by, by the Overton story, because indeed, when you look at his accomplishments, uh, it, it, it definitely was an inspirational story. Um, we have a question from um, Steve Schlegel. Uh, what was the timeline of the preparation of your work? That is, when did you decide to start the project and when was it finished? Just, just a timeline question relating to process of writing. 
Okay, I actually, and I, I made a reference to doing, you know, preliminary research, and, and, I, and I want to give a shout out in that regard to my, my fellow pal, panelists, uh, Professor Reed. Uh, when I began to conceptualize this particular project, uh, the first person I thought of and touching base with was, was, was Christopher Reed, and, and, and Professor Reed was just very forthcoming in terms of information that he had about Anthony Overton. In fact, uh, Professor Reed gave me a very important lead. He gave me the contact information for Anthony Overton's granddaughter, uh, Sheila Overton Levi, who in fact, I have an extended section of the book that talks about her recollections of Anthony Overton as a grandfather. And again, to me, that's a very important part of the book because it sorts of humanize, it has a nice human touch to the Anthony Overton story. Uh, started preliminary research in 2019. Uh, a project such as this, again, the issue in terms of the sources uh, early on, you know, I was trying to figure out, you know, what do I want to say regarding Anthony Overton and his career? And one of the things you do as, as a scholar is that, you know, you share your manuscript with, with other colleagues for input, because in fact, Professor Reed was gracious enough to look at a earlier draft of the manuscript, and he gave me some good suggestions on how I could proceed. But literally it from 2009 to uh, a publication date of March of 2020. So about 11 years. Oh. Um, Steve said, thanks so much for your work and teaching. Um, terrific. So, Thank you. Um, I actually had a question. Um, in in reading for the series and, and reading numerous books on um, uh, various, you know, black entrepreneurs and, um, you know, background material. Um, I was, I was struck by what seemed to be particular challenges in finding primary materials. And can, can you kind of speak toward um, how you, how you found your primary materials and, you know, is, is that a particular problem with this sort of research or is it, you know, a problem across the board? Well, I think with African-American history in general, you know, one of the challenges that, you know, scholars face is, you know, getting access to, you know, quote unquote, traditional primary sources. Among other things, I think that's why oral history is such an important part of many projects, but obviously uh, with, with, with Anthony Overton, though, you know, one of the persons I did interview that knew Anthony Overton was Timmy O'Black, but there aren't a lot of people today that, you know, I could, and that's why the interview with uh, Sheila Overton Levi was so important because again, she had a, a firsthand account. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, Dun and Bradstreet reports were very helpful. Uh, the Half Century Magazine was extremely important because I have an entire chapter on the Half Century Magazine where I, you know, get into some content analysis of the magazine and, and the like. Uh, Overton was involved in a variety of court cases in the 20s and 30s. And, and during my time, when I was a Black Metropolis Research Consortium fellow in the summer of 2010, I was able to access a lot of court documents, both from municipal court as well as the federal court. But yeah, it, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's a, and newspapers obviously, are, are, are very important as, as well. But yeah, it, it, it's a challenge. And again, that's something that, you know, African-American historians to this day, uh, you know, you have to have a, I think a special streak of persistence, you know, to, to continue to move forward because I'm not gonna lie, there were several times, especially early on when I was doing the to research and I was thinking, Man, what did you get yourself into? <laughs> but again, 
I, I was able to, to, to move forward and fortunately, you know, uh, bring the project to fruition. We have one last question um, from Will Barnes. What was Overton's sources of capital that helped him get his start in business? Well, that's uh, a great question. And again, that's a question that there's still a, a certain amount of, of mystery in, in terms of uh, how he accumulated that capital. Uh, and, and again, and it, you know, there's a lot of sketchiness when we talk about you know, the early years of Overton Hygienic. And in fact, one of the primary sources that we have for the early years of Overton Hygienic was a presentation he gave at the 1912 meeting of the National Negro Business League in Chicago, which among other things was sort of his you know, coming out party in his new hometown. But, and, and, and again, just based upon you know, some other areas where you know, we have to take some of Overton's pronouncements with a grain of salt, if you will, especially in terms of his pre-Chicago uh, experiences, his source of capital uh, before he came to Chicago, again, you know, remains uh, a bit nebulous. And, and again, I'm, 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 I'm glad for that particular question because with, some, with this particular project based upon the challenges, I think I've been successful in, you know, outlining the contours of Anthony Overton's life. To, to a reasonable extent. But there are some, you know, some real specific things that, you know, I, I admittedly know that, you know, I wasn't able to discover everything there was to know, but I think what I was able to discover was, you know, you know, in the end result, it does make, I think, an important contribution to the history of, of Black Chicago and especially uh, the history of Black business in Chicago. I want to thank you both so that, much for that, being here. Uh, Karen, Cheryl. Yes. Can I piggyback? I, I was amazed in the last 10 years to see references that either overlooked or didn't know existed that talked about the amount of capital, not great amounts of capital, but capital that was being accumulated in the South Side community. We have to keep in mind in the 1920s, there was a large labor base uh, made up of migrants and people who had been here before the migration who were working now in the steel mills, in the packing houses, and, and there was capital plus migrants, according to Charles Johnson, the renowned sociologist, had arrived in Chicago during World War I with small amounts of capital. So there was money available and it was to be found in the Binger Bank, in the Douglas National, and in at least eight white banks and the First National Bank of Chicago uh, at that time. So the community was not an impoverished community. It was just not a wealthy community. And there was a, a pool of, of uh, persons around who could contribute somewhat to uh, the uh, accumulation of capital for investment. Well, thank you very much. This has been a, a fascinating conversation. I. I, I can't even begin to tell you how grateful I am that you all have taken the time to do this. And um, I hope in the future, we can all get together here at the Union League Club, actually face to face and and raise a glass to Anthony Overton. So. Sounds great. Be great. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. I appreciate every, all of your time. Oh, my pleasure. And thanks, uh, Professor Reed, for your participation in this event. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Thanks to the club. Take care. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.